Our business account manager covering Alberta, Saskatchewan, and Manitoba, providing a client-focused, tailored approach to lending. She has 15 plus years of agricultural experience, including banking, farm management, consulting, and commodity trading. Lindsay has in-depth experience in financial structuring and modeling, industry benchmarking, uh, performance management, and succession planning. Lindsay has a Bachelor of Commerce from the University of Saskatchewan. Um, so thanks, Lindsay, for joining us. We're really looking forward to it. Thank you very much, Heather. Oh, I'm good. That was a really in-depth introduction. Um, to sum it up, I am originally from a grain farm in southern Saskatchewan. The town name is Yellowgrass, Saskatchewan, to give you an indication of how big that place was. I went to Saskatoon to take finance to just become the wolf of Wall Street. I was never going to have anything to do with agriculture because my parents had lost their minds. And then fast forward to my very first job, I was a commodity trader, I loved it. Then my next job, I was an agricultural consultant, I did that for a long time, and now as an agricultural banker. So I have spent my entire career in agriculture, I think because of the people, because of the business, it's something I'm really passionate about. So really proud farmer's daughter, I try and help on the farm wherever I can. Um, but actually, anyone who's had the pleasure of driving with me, I get to drive nothing. <laughs> the repairs and maintenance bill is very high when I'm around, so I help mainly as a pencil farmer. I like to look at the finances. I love ag risk management. Um, and yeah, I'll talk to you today about getting to a place of yes with your lender. Timely access to capital is a critical component in running farm businesses today. Um, I certainly don't have all of the answers for you here today. But it is my hope that we can go through some things and I can maybe introduce some ideas from a banking perspective that will help you be prepared and help increase your chances of getting yes and getting access to that capital that is so critical to your business. Um, BMO has a long history of working with agricultural clients. We've been working with farmers and ranchers for over 200 years. Um, we have been there through the ups and downs, we understand the cycles of ag, and we are in it for the long term. Uh, we try and provide flexible financing solutions for many things, inputs, landing quota, equipment purchasing or leasing, building construction, building leasing, and any day-to-day -day operational financing you may have. We also have a fairly robust online banking platform. We understand in today's business, cash management and being able to operate your business from wherever you are is critical. So whether you're sitting in front of the computer, sitting in your combine, or traveling wherever you are, um, we want to ensure you can run your business efficiently. And lastly, I think, uh, last thing on BMO, our aim is really to be a partner in your business. It's something we talk about a lot. We want to know your story. We understand our story and we really want to partner with those that will work well with us. We really want to help you achieve your specific dreams and goals. So getting to the place of yes with your banker, whether it's your first time accessing financing, whether you're looking for additional financing for a new purchase, or whether you're considering switching financial institutions. Um, the goal of today is to help you be prepared and present yourself in a way that will increase your chances of getting a yes from your lender. So each credit application is different. Anytime we're approached with a new opportunity, we're going to view that opportunity as a new business. Some key factors we'll look at from an initial standpoint are your personal credit bureau score. And so this is for any owners of the business, any owners, partners, shareholders. Ideally, there's no personal bankruptcy within the past six years, and there is a credit score of 700 or higher. To mitigate this risk, to ensure your credit score is in a good position before you walk through the doors, um, cancel any unnecessary credit cards, pay back those credit cards on time, and don't go over your limit pretty straightforward. If you are curious what your credit score is, you can just go to equifax.ca. I think it's like 15 to $20 and you can check what that credit score is before you walk through the door. 
Think about what your personal net worth is. We're going to talk a lot about what you have inside of the farm, but we'll also consider what you own personally, that being your personal assets and your personal liabilities. So things like personal residences, GICs, RSPs, investments, those things can all be considered. Provide and have prepared your financial statements and tax returns. So I think you heard this morning from Stu, obviously a financial statement done on an accrual basis is what's ideal for us to work with. Tax returns are done on a cash basis and there can be some manipulation there because we want to pay as little tax as possible. I'm all for it, but it doesn't really present a really accurate reflection of the business. So if you do have those financial statements performed on an accrual basis, that's the ideal for us. Um, there are different levels of financial statements and depending on the size of the ask and the risk of the business, we may require different levels of insurance. Being a notice to reader statement might be just fine. Even better if it's got really fantastic notes attached. If you've got a larger ask, we may be requiring a review or an audited statement. And lastly, on this list, and those, I think the top three are kind of self-explanatory. We'd expect that walking into a banking meeting. I need to have my personal net worth. I need to bring my financial statements and tax returns. Of course, my credit score is going to matter. The last thing I suggest you bring is maybe not top of mind, but I think as a lender and as I'm trying to get an idea of what's going on in operation, operational information is so helpful when viewing a new application. So be prepared for a deep assessment into your business, including size and scale, relevant industry information, understanding seasonal fluctuations, all of those things. We want to understand what makes your business unique. We also want to understand what your needs from us are. So really give that thought before you come through the door. So what to bring with you. Bring your plan. Have thoughts about what your vision is for your farm. A vision is sort of like a visual painting of where it is now and where you'd like to see it go in the next one, five, ten years. So think size, think management, think of all of those things. In an ideal world, this is where I'd grow to. In an ideal world, I'm downsizing to this. That's all really critical information when we get to and if we get to structuring discussions. So please bring along some kind of a, a thought process of what your ideal scenario is. Next, if you have them, and I recommend that you do, um, bring along for any financial projections or forecasts along with assumptions that you have for the year. So financial statements are great. They provide us almost like a report card of your historical farm information. And that's really valuable information. But if you're approaching the bank and you're considering a change or an expansion or something is going to look different, that's where a financial projection becomes key. Bring, so bring along that financial projection. My third statement is maybe the one that we wouldn't think about as often. Um, and that is operational information that you can provide us. So things like a detailed crop plan. You could bring along your statement of coverage and premiums if you're a grain farmer. That gives me really great information because it gives me great information about your risk management strategy, but it also allows me to see your historical yields. I'd love to see if you're outperforming the industry, if you're outperforming your area, show me because I can add that to my discussion with our credit department. If you're not a grain farm, if you're in other industries, think about bringing along, like for supply management, bring along your milk statements, bring along your DHI, flock reports. All of that is going to highlight for us things that you're doing well within your operation. And it also allows us to develop some type of scale to your financial statements and projections. So for a grain farm, if there's a net income of 500,000, is that good or is that bad? Well, it depends on how many acres you're farming. So bringing along that additional operational information will really allow us to get a snapshot view into your farm. And the risk management strategy, I think we've heard risk management or business risk management all day today. 
So I hate to, to continue on with it, but it's so critically important. Um, bring along with you, do you participate in agri-stability? Do you participate in crop insurance? What do you normally take for coverage? Do you take private hail? Do you participate in private insurance things like GARS? Bring along that stuff with us. It's giving us really great information, but it's also giving us insight into your risk management strategies. From the cattle side, do you participate in LPIP? Do you normally contract X percentage by X amount of time? Do you have how many cattle contracted or hedged as you go into the new year? These are all really important pieces of information that will help us assess a new um, financing application. So of course, be prepared, bring along the tax returns and the financial statements and <coughs> the personal net worth as well, but think about having a package put together that you can come and really showcase your farm. Other things we're going to look at besides the numbers, because we do, we sometimes look at more than an Excel spreadsheet, it's shocking, I know. Um, but we are going to look at something we refer to as the four M's, so something a little more qualitative. Number one being who is the management of this operation? What is their experience? Who do they have on staff? What's their track record? Because keep in mind, management, and I think I heard a comment earlier today, I think it was maybe from Heather on the farm panel, those people making management decisions are the ones that impact the money and the markets and the material. So it's really important for us to understand who you are, who's on your team, and why they're fantastic. Um, in terms of markets, this is an idea of what you're selling. And if you are doing anything unique or niche, so if you're growing specialty crops or getting some kind of a premium for a certain size of cage, please tell us all of that information because it allows us to see who is your competition, what are you selling into, what premiums are you getting, so that we can understand what you're selling into. Um, materials is also a question we're going to want to understand. What is your labor requirements and are there any shortage concerns? What type of equipment do you need? Do you have a sufficient amount of equipment? Do you need more equipment? And of course, the money. That's where the financial statements and the projections and the crop plans all come into hand. So what will a banker look at? A banker just asked you for all this information. I've said, bring this, 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 and this, and I've got a big stack of papers. What am I really digging down to on a conceptual or a fundamental level? A banker is going to look at liquidity, and that is your working capital position. What is your ability to pay quick bills that are due right away, but also what is your re ability to repay long-term obligations? A bank is going to look at security. And I think there's a little bit of a misconception in agriculture because we have this land base, the quota, these high value assets, the equipment, that it's all we look at, right? I have all this land, it's worth this much. I'm very secure, give me the money. We of course look at it. I'm a banker, we love a nice safe and sound loan. The more the better. Um, but it's not the only thing we look at. We also are looking at what is the type of security. Is it inventory and cash? Is it land? Is it equipment? What is the makeup of that security? And we're, of course, going to assess your past performance. We're really going to take a deep dive into past performance if it doesn't match your projection at all as well, right? We've all seen the projections where they're very optimistic, and that's fantastic. I love optimism. I don't think any of us would be farmers if we weren't optimistic. But if it's very different from fast performance, I need to understand why. So kind of in wrapping up your preparation of walking through the door, I tell you all these things not to be intimidated. I tell you them because I do think it's really important to present your story, to be the proactive storyteller of your operation and the proactive communicator of what you're asking for. It's our job to interpret that. It's our job to have suggestions on structure and all of those things. And that's something you should be looking for in a lender. But it's also okay to say, these are my expectations and this is what I want. And if I'm going to tell you my expectations and what I want, the more proof I have, the stronger my case. So, when meeting a banker for the first time or evaluating between several bankers of which one you want to use or if you 
kind of have a risky new venture that you want to see if someone will go out on a limb for, I really do suggest you think about building out that story rather than just bringing the traditional materials you think you're going to need. If you're concerned at all that, well, I heard this girl talking about all this stuff I need to bring, she had a laundry list and I can't remember any of it, ask ahead of time. Hey, I have a meeting with you at 2.30 next Tuesday. I'd love to be prepared. Is there anything specific I can bring for you? I have some other things as mine as, as well. I'll bring those too. But really present yourself and your story in the best light. So it wouldn't be a banker presentation without a bit of discussion on numbers and financial ratios and everyone's favorite discussions. Um, I know it's a little bit dry. But I'm going to do my best to keep this straightforward, and I'm going to do my best to discuss these financial ratios in a way of explaining why they're important. So we'll look at four today. These aren't the only ones we look at. I'm just taking some of the big ticket numbers here. Um, we will look at EBITDA, which I'll explain. We'll look at debt service coverage ratio, also sometimes called the fixed charge coverage ratio. We'll look at a current ratio, and then we'll look at your debt to equity, also sometimes called debt to tangible net worth. My one comment on ratios is I like ratios as much as the next girl, but one year's ratios tell a little bit of a story. Three year's ratios tell a much better story. Five year's ratios, even better. Because ratios are a snapshot at one point in time. They're a great indicator of what's happened, but if we can see trends, they become much more impactful. So first, EBITDA. EBITDA stands for earnings before interest, tax, depreciation, and amortization. So when you get your financial statements, if you're getting an accrual financial statement, there'll be several elements to your financial statement. There'll be your balance sheet, mainly, which has your assets and your liabilities, and there will be your accrual income statement, which is telling you how much net income you made. Now here's a very straightforward statement, but in all my years of consulting, I've always been a little intrigued at the amount of people who do not know this basic principle, your net income at the bottom. I think you all know if you saw your account statement at the beginning and the end of the year, that's not the cash in your pocket. Another blanket statement here, that net income number hasn't serviced any principle. So there is that, that net income number is not the final number. So if we're looking year over year, and net income has grown by $100,000, it went from $500,000 to $600,000, awesome. That's great. Pat yourselves on the back. But know that that net income number wasn't enough. If your debt obligation was $700,000, well, it wasn't. So first, we have to convert it to an EBITDA. This essentially is taking your net income number, making some adjustments to become a more reflective picture of the free cash you have available to service principal and interest. Does that make sense? Okay. Now, we take that EBITDA and we have to convert that net income number because we haven't paid cash for our amortization, we have more cash available, and we get to a free cash number. We then can convert that EBITDA number to our debt service coverage ratio. DSC measures the operation's ability to make debt and interest payments. Um, debt payments, I want to specify here, can include debt you owe to the bank, but it can also include any third-party debt you have or any obligations to repay shareholders. So make sure when you're looking at your debt obligations, you're being inclusive with everything that's going to happen in the year. Also, look closely at when you are signing your term sheets or your credit applications, the other adjustments that may be included in your debt service. So one of the famous ones that people don't think of are repayments of dividends, repayments to shareholders, and unfunded capital expenditure or unfunded capex. What does unfunded capital expenditure mean? It means you bought a long-term asset in cash. Sounds great in principle, right? Buying a long-term asset in cash. That's, we just saw that great question that said, should I be keeping my debt and paying for things in cash? That's fantastic. You should do that. But know that 
If you paid for that cash, but your operating line increased, we didn't actually pay for it in cash. And that is going to negatively impact your debt service capacity ratio. Riveting, guys, I promise. We'll go up from here. <laughs> OK, so why are EBITDA and DSC important? Um, we're cash flow lenders. Again, we're going to talk about security next, and it's important. But we want to ensure when you're lo we are loaning you money that you can repay us through your operations. I'm a farm girl. I never want to have a discussion with my client where they have to liquidate an asset, let alone land, to repay me. I never want to have that discussion. I want my clients to be resilient enough and I want our structure to be appropriate that they can generate enough cash from their operations to repay their debt. So here's a really basic example of why structure matters. And this is just one instance, keeping it very basic. If this operation had a historical EBITDA of 500,000 and we're seeking a $4 million loan, let's say interest is 7% for this discussion. If they were to say, I'm gonna pay that back over 10 years, I don't like debt, I'm gonna pay it back over 10 years. We have 90 cents of free cash available for every dollar of debt of principal and interest owed. Whereas if we put that over 20 years, we have a dollar 34 of free cash available for every dollar of principal and interest owed. Very basic example, but a very important discussion of understanding what your business can service and ensuring you are structuring your debt in a way that you can service it every year. So um, in thinking of EBITDA and debt service and maybe some of the younger farmers in the room, I ask, and I only ask the question, you don't have to answer, but I, in my past consulting experience, I can know that sometimes not everyone knows this answer offhand. But it is, do you know what your annual debt obligation is? A colleague of mine used to say, like, flip the income statement upside down. Do you know what your expenses are? Do you know what you owe to the bank? Do you know? Think about all those things. Flip it right upside down. And then do your crop plan or do your, do your gross margin for your cattle. Is it enough? So do you know what your annual debt obligation is? Do you know what your historical EBITDA is? So I know what my net income was, but do I actually know what my free cash was? And then have you looked at your upcoming year? So think I've done this this many times. I know I owe this much. When I look forward to next year, do I have enough? Uh, the next discussion is liquidity. And here we'll talk about your current ratio. A current ratio is a measure of your working capital. And essentially, it's your current assets, which are assets that will convert to cash within the next 12 months. That's things like cash, inventory, uh, accounts receivable, over things that you have to pay within the next 12 months. That's your balance on your operating line. That's accounts payable. So, and your current portion of long-term debt. So in this example, I have 1.5 of current assets. I have 681 of current liabilities. I have $2.31 of quick cash available for every dollar I owe of my quick payments. That's a pretty comfortable position. But in looking at a current ratio, my one warning is that current ratios can be a little misleading at times. And I have a picture of a water bottle here, and my thought is always, so I always carry my water bottle. Sometimes I forget it in my car overnight. I live in Canada. I go back to have a drink the next day, it's frozen solid. Like, I'm thirsty, I have liquid, I'm still thirsty, right? Liquid assets can be much the same way, so you have to give thought of it. Cash, that's really liquid, I can pay for something right now. Grain, cattle, calves, that's a little trickier, because if I have an August delivery and an April payment, I've got liquid stuff, I know it's there, but I'm really thirsty. Right, so that's where you have to think about that and I do suggest you proactively communicate with your banker. Maybe April, May, June's a really tight time. The whole year long, Lindsay, if you give me a $500,000 operating line, that's great. But in April, May, and June, I might need six because I know 
I've got a bunch of stuff in the field. It's coming. It looks great, but I can't use it till September. The next discussion is an idea of security. And in this example, I'm talking about debt to equity. In the previous discussion, we had the discussion of debt to assets. Um, we can also refer to this as debt to tangible net worth. Um, all of them are measuring the same thing. And that's essentially how much equity or how much asset do you have versus your debt load. Um, this is a measure of security to the bank. Essentially, the higher the level of equity, the lower risk to the bank, or vice versa. It's fairly straightforward. Um, keep in mind, if there are shareholder loans, not to get too deep into things, but if you can subordinate them, and sometimes a, a bank can include those as equity. So what types of security will a bank look at? Um, there are different types of collateral you can use. Uh, farmland is fairly obvious. Quota, equipment and machinery, inventory. And banks will give different lending values to different types of assets. So that is how the bank will come up to what is the total amount that I can borrow to you. Again, discussion on how much can they actually debt service. But when looking at it from a security perspective, we'll give different values to different types of assets. OK, so it's your turn to be the banker. You have three applications come across your desk. Farm A is asking for a million dollars. Farm B is asking for $50 million. And Farm C is asking for $15 million. You're a new banker, right? You're looking at all of these things. The 50, Farm B might be like, whew, I don't know about that one. That's risky, $50 million. That's a lot, right? So maybe initially, with the information we have, Farm B is maybe looking like a bit of a risk. Farm A, still seems, million dollars still seems like a lot, but maybe not. And Farm C is asking for quite a bit as well. Next layer of information comes through your desk. Again, they came really prepared for the meeting. They brought you their stack of information. Farm A has 10 million in assets. Farm B has 150 million in assets. And Farm C has 20 million in assets. So again, which one of these is the riskiest loan? We have to continue building the picture. So really, farm A, in terms of leverage, isn't that high. We've got a nice, safe, sound loan there. Farm B is a pretty comfortable level as well. It's a big dollar ask, but there is a big engine behind them. There's a lot of assets there. And farm C, well, that's getting a little bit tighter, right? That's getting a little bit high on the leverage perspective. Now we've got to continue layering on these ratios. Let's continue building the story. Because remember, I think there's maybe a preconceived notion that security is it. And it's not. Because again, we want our clients to be resilient. We want our clients to generate enough cash flow to service their debt. So debt service capacity, farm A, is only generating 80 cents for every dollar they would owe on that million. And it's not something uncommon to see a really large asset base or something worth a lot that is maybe not kicking out as much cash as we'd prefer because of the extreme appreciation in land and quota values. Farm B is generating $1.50 of cash for every dollar they would owe, and Farm C is generating $1.10. But again, we're not just here to look at ratios. We have to layer on a few more things. Farm A's information they brought was maybe a little weaker. Maybe we had a tax return. We were missing a bit of information. We didn't have an accrual financial statement. Harder to tell what's going on in that business. Farm B maybe brought across some fantastic audited statements. Can tell a lot what's going on there. And Farm C as well. But here's the last thing that you're going to consider as you're the lender. Farm A answered all of your questions. No question went unanswered. Could I see that information? Absolutely, you can. Let me tell you about the history of my farm. Farm B, same thing. Professional company, maybe brought some PowerPoint slides, told you everything that was going on in their business. 
They had a side business. They happily disclosed what was going on there. And then Farm C wasn't as willing to share information about who was involved in the business, about who owned the business, about a side business. So we had some cause for concern. So as you look through this information, when we started, Farm B maybe looked like the riskier choice. But as we go through all of this, as we dig deeper, as we utilize those financial ratios to understand what's going on in the business, it may actually turn out that that very large loan is more safe and sound than the smallest one. So that's sort of how we, if I take you through like a very high level credit process, there is one. I can tell you now that I'm underwriting loans and presenting to credit. Banking is interesting in that you are, as a relationship manager, which I am, I'm here to get to know you, I build the case, and I present it to credit, who very purposefully does not know you. So it's my job to sell this, and it's credit's job to sort of go through this and say blindly, no, 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 this works, or yes, 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 this works. So the more information I get from you, the better my case to credit. And Sean will laugh because we present to the same credit person, but he's a little scary. He's very dry. <laughs> he's, he doesn't want any fluff. He wants to know the case. So generally when I'm presenting to try and get initial support for an application, by the end of it, I'm sweating. I'm like, oh my gosh. And then at the end, he usually says, yes, that's a great idea. You have sound support. Let's carry on. But just know that from a banking perspective, we are following a process. We're looking at individual applications. We're assessing it on a multi-layer thing. I think I heard Darren say this morning, there's like 20 things we look at, and it's probably being shy on the number. Um, but there is a process and a methodology to your madness, and I assure you, if you've ever received a no from a bank, it's probably not a like, nah, because we want to lend you money too, and we want to be partners in your business. So that's getting to the place of yes. Um, that's how to sort of maybe open the door, crack the door open, get that first yes. But that is not the only <laughs> important thing when keeping a really great relationship with your lender. You need to keep in a place of yes. So let's discuss a little bit about this. I have here cash is king. I've already heard it a few times today. Um, but it is. Having access to money in a timely fashion is critical when operating your business. I laughed when I heard the like cash is king thing because I, I thought back. My dad used to have this sled rally that they did with all of his friends. They were all farmers and entrepreneurs, and it was called the cash is king rally. So I guess it really is rings true. Um, but you do need to have access to capital to your business. And a factor in how quickly you can access that capital is how well you've maintained a relationship with your lender, and on the flip side, how well your, relation, your lender has maintained a relationship with you, because it's a two-sided coin. It goes both ways. So the first way to keep in a place of yes with your lender is maybe the easiest thing to do, but not always the most common thing done. Submit your reporting on time. It's one of the easiest ways to keep in your banker's good graces. So your reporting requirements will be outlined in your contract, whether it's a term sheet, a credit agreement, whatever you and your lender refer to that as. Um, it will, your reporting requirements will be outlined in that contract. Some reporting requirement examples are things like submission of your year-end financial statements within 90 days of your fiscal, right? So that means your year-end is December 31st, 90 days later, I want a piece of paper on my desk that says, your farm's financial statements. That's what that means. Maybe you need to submit quarterly financial statements based off internal results. So maybe I need to see your bookkeeping quarterly. Maybe you margin your operating line, and I need to see monthly submissions of your borrowing base so we can determine the level and size of your operating line. All of these things are outlined for you, but are critically important in maintaining a good relationship with your bank. And you need to know and understand that if you come for a new ask, if you have a last minute money request and you haven't submitted that prior information, it's almost impossible to get through because I've got these hanging things that aren't addressed yet. I don't know where your business is at and then you're asking me for more. That's really hard for me to execute. Also, just a note, and I think I'm echoing um, some comments made earlier, but if you're paying for financial reporting, if your bank says you need this financial statement and it costs you X amount of money a year, make the most of it. If you do internal operational bookkeeping, 
Ensure that your financial statement has operational statements. If you're doing the work, make sure your account's not lumping it together. Make sure you're having meaningful and impactful conversations with your accountant and with your lender about interpreting those financial statements. What does that year mean? I don't, I, I, I mean, the balance sheet should balance, that's a given. But what do the numbers behind it mean? Please ensure that your people that you're hiring and paying to create these objects for you are communicating all of those things to you. Next is to know your covenants. Covenants are essentially the rules set out by the lender. Thou shalt, thou shall not. Pretty straightforward. But in my past experience in consulting, I would at times work with clients who've come under some financial distress. Maybe their current lender has asked them to seek new financing. Maybe they're really having working capital issues. A common conversation when I had these um, discussions with clients is that they didn't know their covenants. They didn't know they were breaking the rules and then they were questioning why their banker was getting nervous. So it's our job as your bankers to explain those rules. You should know what your covenants are. But if you don't and you're in a, an arrangement, please look them up and understand them. Do not sign an agreement or a term sheet based on a rate alone, right? Oh, that's, I've got three offers in front of me. This one's the best rate. Look at it, of course. But also look and understand what are the reporting requirements and what are the rules of thou shall and thou shall not. Because very often I think we're assessing multiple things with rates alone. And those are important, but if their covenants are set in a way that you cannot achieve them, Maybe that's not the best partnership for you. Avoid surprises. So this, I say a little tongue in cheek. I'm a farm girl. I've got a ton of egg clients. Well, I've only got egg clients. I know surprises happen all the time. But here's a little inside tip for you guys. Bankers aren't super risky. Shocker, I know. <laughs> like, we, we, we don't love finding out things after the fact. Uh, we're not a huge fan of surprises. It's not our thing. Not our thing at all. So I've had a lot of phone calls and they're sometimes hilarious. And usually they start with something like, Lindsay, I hope you're sitting down. I'm like, oh great, here we go. But it's, I shouldn't be telling you this, but this is literally the worst barley crop I've ever combined in my life. I'm like, oh great. Or I know we talked last week and I told you my operating line was enough, but cattle placements are really expensive right now. I need more money. Or sometimes it's just a text message with a combine on fire. <laughs> and it says, oops. <laughs> You're like, whoa, didn't I just finance that? So that's the thing, though. I want to know. Tell me. Tell me the good, the bad, and the ugly. Don't tell me after the fact. Don't tell me when all the covenants are broken. And you're like, well, yeah, I had a crap barley crop and my combine caught on fire. I'm like, what? When did that happen? Last year? So please just tell me. Say, I hope you're sitting down. Sit, preface it with whatever you want. But we want to know when things go offside. Because quite frankly, we can probably help you manage that. Um, these things happen. We're an egg. We know. We're in here for the cycles. We're in here for the ups and downs. Same discussion. If you are doing your projections, you're doing all your homework, and feed prices are high, or cattle prices are down, or you know you're going to break your covenants, tell me. Listen, Lindsay, Q3, Q4, things are looking rough, but Q1 and Q2 of the following year, we're going to pick back up, and here's why. That's great for me to know. I can communicate with that with my credit. We can anticipate any issues, and we can kind of meet things at the head before you're breaching those covenants. Um, if you do have an issue with covenants or the thou shalt, thou shalt not, and you know you're going to do it, just tell us. We'd prefer to know. Um, plan and communicate your plan. So look to the future. Um, my favorite thing is if I get my hands on a capital expenditure plan. And I know I need like more exciting things in my life, but to me it's the best. And it's I'm going to buy this many combines and I'm going to have this purchase and I'm going to have this purchase and I'm selling these three things. So I need $3 million this year. And I go, awesome. Let's see if we can make that work. Let's make sure we're ready. Or I've got an old neighbor. I know he's going to sell that land. I know it's coming. It's going to happen between next week and the next three years. Perfect. Let's structure something for you so you can be the first one at, at the door to buy that land. But tell me 
don't tell me after. And again, the same one who texts me the combine on fire, texts me uh, one time, need two million, signed a contract, already bought it. <laughs> Good, okay, let's see what we can do. Time is my friend, time is your friend. Communicate your plans. Also, if you are doing some kind of a projection for your banker, um, don't just make it for your banker. Make it for you. Make it in a format that's valuable to you. Make it in a format that you can adjust your yield or your rotation and see the impact. Make it in a format that you can see what happens when interest rates rise and toggle it on and off and say, oh man, 2%, 200 basis points, this guy told me. What happens if 200 basis points happen? Model that stuff in so that you can even have those discussions with me of, okay, this is what I think is gonna happen and here are the sensitivities I ran or it's gonna be way better than next year, last year and here's why. So make these projections work for you. Projections are sort of like your score clock. And having nothing is sort of like going to a game with a broken score clock. It's true that as farmers, you are doing the things. Financials are a lagging indicator. Do you know what I mean? You make the changes by changing your fertilizer input or by changing your feed rotation. Those are the big ticket items that will change the score clock. But if you don't have a score posted, how do you know if that change to your feed rotation was the right one to do? So again, I just really want to emphasize the importance of making a plan and thinking through that plan and just really going through all those what ifs. And again, I say that because I'm the risk adverse banker who loves to know the what ifs ahead of time. Oh, look at the E, that's gonna bug me. Communicate your strengths. Um, tell your banker about the things you do really well. Um, we want, I think as Canadians, we're a little bit like humble. We don't generally go bragging about ourselves, but when you meet with your banker, tell them. Tell them what you do really well. Tell them what makes you different. Um, you have a bumper yield? Call us and tell us, we'd love to hear it. Um, are you attending this conference and you learned all these different things? Tell us, we wanna know about that. Um, are you having some really great succession discussions with a bunch of, with a couple different providers? Tell us, we'd love to know your succession discussions. So communicate the strengths that you have that will keep you in a place of yes. And um, I think this has been a common theme of the day as well. Utilize us, utilize your professionals and ask for help. I like Excel spreadsheets, I love them. Formula I can't quite figure out, nothing gives me greater pleasure. I'm probably the only one in the room that would say that. Actually, there's probably a few, a few others of us in here too. But if, you're, if it's not your thing, it's not your thing. You can hire it out. There is fantastic help available for you through cloud, through CFO services, through agricultural consultants. Um, your accounting providers can be such a, such a great resource for you. If you've got covenants and you don't know how to calculate them, ask for a template, ask for help, use who's around you. And if you can't find the right person around you, try and find someone else who can help you. Okay, last thing, um, I've talked a lot about lending today and getting to a place of yes with your lender, but the one thing I wanna put on your radar is we can do more than just loan you money, okay? There's fantastic online banking platforms for you that help you manage your cash. There's point of sale systems available. You can do investments, cross border, foreign exchange, capital partners, succession planning, trusts and estates, referrals outside of the bank, helping you access additional financing like through EDC or other options, employee retention benefits. There's something called bank at work or group RSPs. As you bring your business to us, please know that there are other ways we can help your business that's not just accessing a loan. And lastly, um, your banker is your partner. I think there's like this big bad wolf thing, like banks are coming for my keys. I don't want them. Intimidation is not really a strong suit of mine. I don't have the build for it. I'd rather be a partner in your business. I'm not that mean. Um, so please let us. Let us know what's going on in your business and let us be a partner in your business. So I think that's a lot of me talking. Um, I'm happy to take any questions, but I'm also happy and to open this up if there's any suggestions you have. I'd like to learn from our experiences. If there was a prior fantastic relationship you had with the bank, what made it great? 
If there was ones that weren't so great, what made it not so great? Or you can just go get a glass of water. But thank you guys so much. Oh my gosh, are those for me? Oh, question. Oh, wait. Those ones might not be for you yet. Oh, it says my. Oh, I think we're getting <gasps> it. Yeah, get oh it and update it. So we're going to put up our. I saw prices and I started we'll, <laughs> we'll put up our Mentimeter again. We just had to get rid of some old questions. But yeah, thank you so much, Lindsay, for uh, sharing with us how to get that yes, how to keep that yes. And um, yeah, I do want to reiterate what Lindsay was saying. Like, don't be afraid to talk to your bankers or your lenders. They, you're getting millions of dollars from them. They want to partner with you. They want to help you su succeed. And if they don't have um, information you're looking for, lots of times. They have referrals for accountants or, or lawyers or other professionals that can help as well. Um, and yeah, don't be shy to ask questions if you want to know how to figure out a ratio or what a certain ratio means for your um, your business. They're, they're happy to help. They want to help you succeed. Um, and I will put a little plug in there. We do have a farm financial literacy program um, through Farm Management Canada, and we have a couple of virtual workshops coming up in December, and we'll have more in the new year. So if you're looking for kind of that like crash course in accounting, that's a, that's a really good start. It goes through um, balance sheets, income statements, and some of those ratios that Lindsay was showing, and then a few more um, commodity-specific ones. Um, but I'll let uh, Lindsay go through with her questions now. Okay. Do I have a favorite kind of client? I'm laughing because we never have favorites. Um, but two of them are very extremely different. One gives me PowerPoint presentations, and one gives me text of a burning combine. But I would say I really enjoy working with people who allow me to get a little glimpse into their life as well. Like, I think we can be your partner in banking, but we can also get to know each other. We can also be friends. We can, that's my kind of favorite type of client is where we can go for a lunch and have a great conversation. We can talk about our kids and the rink and all of these things, but we can also get down to business. I think that's why I like egg. So it's maybe not the most professional answer, but I love to, I like to chat. I like to know people. And those are probably my favorite types of clients. Um, you didn't miss, mention a farm visit. Aren't farm visits important, especially for a $50 million request? Yes, they are. Um, that is a great point. And now that you say that, I feel a little silly. Um, farm visits are especially important. We want to see your operations. We want to see the location. And even in terms of maintaining uh, relationship, I think it's important. I think it's important that we come and see you. I think you can expect that of your lender. Um, not only so your lender understands your business, but so that they can really see the day-to-day -day things that you're improving on a visual way. Because conversations are one thing, but seeing it's another. So yes, in a, in a first application process or in a maintaining process, probably expect a farm visit or multiple farm visits. How important is it to you, okay, how important to you, I'm so blind, is it for an operation to revolve or pay down its line of credit every year? Ooh, that's another great question. Um, here's a way to say, I would, I, it's rare that an uh, operating line ever gets down to zero. Life isn't that cyclical, right? That here are all my expenses, here's all my revenue, boom, we're back down to zero. So it's timing. But a real, I think, reflection of what's tying up the operating line is a better question. So have we bought equipment on the operating line? Is there a messy accumulated losses that are sitting there and are not revolving? It's more a matter of, is it inputs that, will, that have been pre-bought and are going to sit for a little while and then they'll be repaid in August? Okay. Because that matches, right? That's quick cash that I'm going to have revenue for that will pay down. So it's never down to zero. I'm okay if it's the right things on the line. It's the wrong things on the line that don't revolve. That's accumulated losses, that's capital purchases, that's whatever else it could be. Land that we thought we'd pay in cash but can't. Those are things sitting on the operating line that shouldn't be there, and that's a different discussion than it revolving perfectly down to zero every year. Oh, no question, just a comment. Thanks for presenting the information in such an approachable way. Great job. Thanks, guys. <laughs> That's nice. <laughs> um, do you promote the use of the advanced payment program, like CCGA, accessing low interest money? Yes, I do. So depending on the size of your operation, you can access up to almost $250,000 interest-free. Now, interest-free being you got to pay it back at the right time. 
So it will accumulate interest eventually. But yes. Utilize low interest, absolutely. That's a smart management. Use it every year. It's underutilized, in my opinion. Would my banker share ratios that I should know and what the target would be? Yeah, I hope so. You can ask. They should. They will know what, they'll know what your requirement is. So they'll know your DSC has to be 1.2. Your DSC this year, ask them if they're not communicating, was 1.4. That's a nice, comfortable position. They should also be able to have a conversation with you of um, if it is 0.8 or it's below 1, how long is it going to be there? What does that make them feel? Your banker should be expressing when they have concerns to you. And not in a way of like, we're walking away, in a way of like, oof. This is a little alarming. What are we going to do to fix this? Do we need to restructure? Do we need to blend and extend? Those are the type of conversations that happen when we are in a, maybe a debt, like when we're not meeting our covenants. But yeah, your banker should share what your covenant should be. Okay. With, oh, I knew I was going to get this one. <laughs> With a rapid turnover of managers, it's hard to keep rebuilding new relationships and then ensuring all the data needed by the bank gets to them, such as information on one's accountant's needs for year ends. I hear your pain, I agree with you. Here's what we are trying to do, I suppose, as I'll speak for BMO. And I'm saying this because I've heard this comment so many times in the past. So I'll speak for BMO on this comment. We have developed an ag vertical, which means that everyone who's doing ag banking within BMO should be somewhat of an ag experienced in agriculture. So even if they don't know your industry, if you are a grain producer or broilers or layers, they should be able to talk the language and understand at a high level what's happening with your operation. Another expectation I would say is that we should be putting into credit our job, our applications in a very detailed manner. It should include succession planning. It should include risk management strategies. It should include size and scale of operation so that when a new manager comes in, they can do something we call back read. So they can look back at old applications and really get to know your farm so that you don't have to repeat yourself a thousand times. So if you do have a new lender and they're asking you information that you've already given to the bank, push back a little. Did you do your back reading? I, I, I took over a portfolio a year and a half ago. I spent probably two months and before every time I went to go see that farm, I read back probably five or six years. Just said, what's been happening here? What's been happening here? I don't want to ask a question that they already have given. Um, any other things to address here? Um, how do we ensure the data? I hope it's like, if you've submitted it, it should be there. That's an expectation on us. And if you're submitting something and we don't have it, there's a problem. So I think that's a fairly standard thing. Um, but it's also our job, and maybe if you're new to the bank, Maybe it's our job to be proactive in communication. Like, remember, you have a review statement, and that includes an inventory audit. So make sure you have someone lined up for that inventory audit coming up because your year ends in two months. That's our job, to make sure you know. It's your job to make sure you get it, but it's our job to make sure you know. Do you have preferred accounting firms that you work with? Um, I do. I, I suppose I have. I'm a bit of a financial statement snob. I like them to be a certain way. But the only reason I say that is because I spent so much of my career benchmarking and looking at performance metrics and looking at how to create operational accounting and all of those things. So there are certain firms that do do operational accounting, gross margin statements, provide really fantastic notes. So yes, I have some preferred ones um, that I think provide a higher level of agricultural financial statement. And financial statements on an ag side, in my view, should be structured in a little bit of a different way than just, here's my revenues, here's my expenses. So yes, I do. I don't know if I'm allowed to say that, but I do. Is a business plan necessary to get a loan? Business plan, um, or can it help lower my interest rates? Okay, business plan is one of my pet peeve words because we all say business plan and everyone would interpret what a business plan is differently. Um, keep in mind the dollar size of your ask or the growth stage of your business. If you're a brand new business without any historicals, yeah, we need a projection, we need a plan because I have nothing to base it off of. If you're a really mature business, you've got great historical financial statements and you're asking for a small dollar amount, do I need a business plan? Probably not. So it's not always a necessity 
And also keep in mind, a business plan can mean a bunch of different things. We, if you went to business school, right, you got this 30-page document, you flop on someone's desk, and you're like, there's my plan. It doesn't have to be that. It could be a PowerPoint one slide of, here's where we're going in the next five years. There's my business plan. So it depends, the size of the ask and the risk of the business determines what that business plan needs to be. And it might need to be just your historical financial statements and a discussion over a table. Um, can it help lower your interest rates? Uh, yeah, it can. If, if, if you can prove or lower your risk, it would lower your interest rate um, because you can prove your business. Yeah, it could lower your interest rate, but it's not a, it's not a given. There's a lot of things that go into interest rates. Do you have transition specialists that work with farm families? So we do have some transition specialists that work with farm families. They'll generally provide um, a service that will assess different parts of your farm. We have lawyers on hand. We have investing specialists on hand. We have estate specialists on hand who will essentially review your business. Um, Transition is one of those things, and Vimo probably wouldn't agree with me on this, but I've spent too much of my time doing it. My suggestion would be um, it takes multiple people to do a really effective succession plan. Succession planning is a bit of a Rubik's Cube where you like move one thing and then all the other colors are mixed up again. So you need a bunch of people working in tandem and your bank is one of them. And they can provide a lot of really valuable um, resources for you to do that. But I, I, I kind of have a buyer beware on anyone who says that they will do everything, right? Because I'm not an expert, and I'm, I'm an expert of very little, actually, but I'm not an expert in everything, nor is, I think, succession planning. But can banks help with transition? Yes. We have resources and specialists on hand. Why are producers choosing BMO over the other lenders? I think, um, I think it's relationship-driven, and I... I'd love to say it's just BMO, and I hope there's no BMO recordings here, but I do think it is relationship-driven. So if you can find a lender that's committed to ag, committed to you, you have good rapport, you can get good information from, I think that's who you're going to choose. So I hope if, if lenders are choosing BMO, it's because we're providing those things. How important are audited financial statements? Um, Notice there's different levels of assurance on financial statements. There's notice to reader, which provides the least level of assurance. There is review, and then there's audit. So audited is the highest level of assurance. Um, an audited financial statement will only become a requirement when the size of the loan or the risk of the operation has gotten to a level where we feel like it is necessary. So to say how important are audited financial statements, it's really dependent on the business and the amount of capital you're trying to access. It's also probably dependent on the other investors you have in your business. If you've got you know, a company investing in your business and they require an audited fine, the more players there are in the game and the more amount of money that's asked, the more due diligence and assurance is going to be required from your statements. Top advice you'd give a new farmer headed into the new year. Oh my gosh, 115. It's counting down. Um, what would be my advice? Uh, take a look at your past performance and take a look at your plan for the next year. Think about the things you can realistically do. Create a plan or a high-level projection. It doesn't need to be an audited projection with a summary of significant assumptions. It can be, I'm going to grow this much barley, this much wheat, this much canola. It's going to cost me this much to grow it. My expenses last year were this much, and I know I owe this much to the bank. Keep it simple. Make it work for you but look at it. That would be my suggestion for, top, for farmers entering into the new year because these prices are high, inflation is high, interest rates are high, the skin in the game is high when you're a new farmer. So just use all the tools in your arsenal to try and help you make good business decisions. Okay, I think that's, that's it. Thanks, guys. <laughs> Thank you so much for having me. Thank you so much.